counselor, and two students, Joseph and Kara. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi, Joseph. How are you today? Fine, thanks. And Kara, how are you? Good. As we discussed on the phone earlier, I wanted to speak with both of you about the subjects you have chosen to study, and how you are managing your time. Okay? Yes. I think so. Okay. So I'll start with Kara. You've been here for how many months now? I've been here for six months. How are you finding it? It's good. I'm enjoying the course. And what about life outside? Are you making friends? And socializing? Not really. People here are quite closed. They don't talk to you. I see. So, what do you do after classes? I usually go home and study, and I might go out for a walk, but never really with anyone. Sometimes my roommate Louisa comes with me, but she always seems to be busy. How is this affecting your schoolwork? I don't think it is, but I miss home. Kara, what I suggest for now is that you look into joining one of the social clubs on campus. There are a variety of them. You can go camping, skiing, snorkeling, painting, dancing, reading, horse riding, rowing. There's a list on the school website. Have a look and work out which one you're interested in and which suits your timetable. You'll meet friends that way. And people who have the same career interests as you. As for the subjects you've chosen for a career in microbiology, I think you should look into dropping one of your subjects and picking it up again next year as a minor. You have a lot on your plate, and this will just cause great pressure. It doesn't mean that you aren't coping, but you're doing about ten hours more than the average student a week. Think about it, and we can make another appointment to discuss it. When are you free? I have an hour free usually on Wednesdays at eleven thirty. Okay, good. Come to my office at eleven forty-five and wait in reception. Okay? Okay. I'll see you then. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Joseph, how are you finding the university? I love it. It's very different from home. Life here is very much focused on study and also socializing through sport. People have been very friendly and curious about my culture. So you've managed to integrate well. I think so. I've joined the rugby team, something I'd never thought I'd be interested in. And how are your studies going? I think I am doing well. I have a few assignments that need some work, but overall, I'm coping. That's good. I'm happy that you're enjoying the university, but remember, don't let your schoolwork get too far behind, because it will pile up, and before you know it, you will be late handing in work. You know that there's a penalty for handing in work late. No, I didn't. You would have been told at the start of the course during orientation. I don't remember. You need to remember these things. They are very important. You might be an excellent student, but if you consistently hand in work late, you'll be penalised, and you might end up losing your degree over it. That's a lot of years of work. Okay? Yes, I'll remember that. <laughs> and also remember that you have to attend ninety percent of your classes. So far, you have missed five tutorials. Be careful here. 
These could also cost you your degree. Is there any particular reason you miss these classes? I'd been training for our rugby match the night before, and well, we went out afterwards, and I slept past my alarm clock. Joseph, I know this culture must be very different from where you come from, but please try and be a little more conservative with your time. I think maybe you should spend more time on your studies, and less time on socialising. The subjects you've chosen are intensive. I want you to spend three hours a night studying before you decide to do anything else. I'll make an appointment to see you in a month, and we can assess your progress. I'll give you my business card. All my contact details are there. Call me in three weeks to organise another meeting. Do you have any questions for me? No, none. Okay, I'll see you in a month. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Who's next, please? I think I am. How can I help you? I just came in on flight 372 from Singapore at 11.30 and my luggage hasn't arrived. I've been waiting at the baggage claim for about half an hour now and everything seems to have come off the plane. The conveyor belt has stopped and all the passengers have gone. So I came here to find out what has happened to my bag. Can I see your ticket, please? Here it is. So you came from Hong Kong today and changed planes in Singapore, right? Yes. The connection in Singapore was a tight one. The plane got in late and I had to rush to get to the next flight. That's the problem right there. There wasn't enough time to get your bags onto the connecting flight. Normally Singapore Airport is very efficient. Now I need you to fill in these forms. Your name? Jenny Lee. Address? I guess you want my address here. I'm staying with relatives. Just a minute, I'll have to look it up. It looks like 583. No, it's 533 East 67th Street in Riverside. Do you have the phone number there? Yes, I do. It's um, 9301... Four two six nine. So you came in on Qantas flight 392. Do you know the number of the flight out of Hong Kong? Let me see. I think it was Cathay Pacific 900 or something. Oh yes, it says here CX912. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Right. Now, I need a description of the luggage. 
How many pieces did you check in? Just one. Can you describe it for me? Here is a picture to help you. OK. It's a big bag, like this one. Rectangular. Not hard shell, but soft covered, and it has a zipper around the front. Is it black? No, sort of a grey colour. Any identification? Just a tag with my name on it. Any other features? Well, it has wheels and a retractable handle on the end, so you can pull it, as well as the handle in the middle. OK, that's fine. Now, if your bag missed the connection, I'm sure it'll be put on the next flight. I'll email Singapore as soon as I finish here. The next flight comes in at 17.50. That's 10 to 6 this evening. You can pick it up then. 10 to 6? That's too long to wait. Can I get my uncle to pick up the bag on his way home from work? Sorry, you have to be here yourself to clear customs. Of course, I almost forgot. Will the bag come here, to this desk? Yes. You pick it up here, then take it over to the customs area. By the way, don't forget to bring your passport. You will also need to have the key, plus your ticket, with a baggage claim number on it. Oh, OK. Guess I'll have to come back tomorrow then. It's lucky I packed everything I need for now in my carry-on bag. Yes, that's always a good idea. Be prepared. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. I'd like to introduce Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator who has come along today to talk to you all about getting your first job or commission as an artist. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you for inviting me. I remember when I graduated back in 1983, I was very excited about getting my first commission. My degree was in fine art and I'd worked long and hard to get it. I was an enthusiastic student and I never found it difficult to find the incentive to paint. I think as a student... London being settled by the Romans explains their lust for blood. By about AD 200, the administration of Britain was divided in two. York became the capital of Britannia Inferior and London of Britannia Superior. Around the same time, the city also acquired its famous walls, probably about 20 foot high. Why did they build such high walls? It was a protective measure which may have been due to civil war, initiated when Governor Claudius Albinus tried to claim the imperial crown in Rome. Was paganism still predominant then? Yes, but Christianity appears to have reached the province at an early date, and only a year after the religion became officially tolerated in the empire, London had its own bishop, Restitutus, who is known to have attended the imperial council of Al. You really delve deep. I think you'll do well on your tutorial paper. Good luck, David. Thanks.
Good morning, all. Welcome to our regular lecture on health issues. This series of lectures is organised by the Students' Union and is part of an attempt to help you stay healthy while coping with study and social life at the same time. It's a great pleasure to welcome back Ms. Mary Kirk, who is a professional health advisor and physical education officer. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be back. Today we're going to discuss the benefits of exercise. University life is hectic and stressful. It also involves a lot of sedentary work, that is, sitting for many hours at a time. What I'd like to focus on is how to approach exercise, not only from the aspect of health benefits, but also as a form of stress relief. I know it's hard to organise your time around studies and socialising, but you can socialise while exercising. If you have an hour free in the morning, afternoon, or evening, it would be a good idea to get together with your friends and create a sports team. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. The grounds of the university are ample enough to support every student's need to become active. There are also readily available facilities at your disposal, such as a football field, tennis, and badminton courts. There's also a swimming centre, and within that building is a gymnasium. With a variety of programs such as aerobics and weight training, if the idea of attending one of these facilities seems daunting, then you can walk along the river. Oh, and that reminds me, the university also offers rowing. If there is a sport that you're interested in that's not on offer, you can approach either your student union representative or speak with sports administration manager, Mr. Lawrence Cavendish. Now I want to talk about why exercise is beneficial physically and emotionally. The obvious results are physical. You can keep fit by using muscles that ordinarily don't get used in the classroom. The health benefits are astronomical. You'll live longer, be happier, and look good. By building muscle, you strengthen your bones, a definite advantage for women in their later stages of life. As women are prone to osteoporosis, it also strengthens your heart. Yes, don't forget your heart is a muscle, and the more exercise you do and the harder you work, the more blood is pumped from your heart to your brain. Now this brings me to the psychological advantages of exercise. When we are active, endorphins are released into our brain. An endorphin is a chemical that is released when your heart rate is pumping beyond its normal capacity. It's the same as adrenaline. You can actually feel when endorphins kick in. You feel a rush, almost a high. The benefits of this are numerous. Your brain works at peak capacity for a longer period of time. Your awareness is maximized, and the fatigue you usually feel at four o'clock in the afternoon. Will be non-existent. In one word, exercise makes you sharp. Now, I'm not saying that you should overdo exercise, because too much of anything can be dangerous. But if you think about your daily routine, you spend about six hours a day in lectures and another two or more hours studying. That's a long time to be sitting, and that is a long time for your body not to be moving around. So try and find at least one hour a day to get some exercise. If you can't fit in one hour a day, try one hour every second day or half an hour a day. You will see rewards instantly. You'll feel great and look great. This I can promise you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk given by Dr. Miranda James. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Now, listen carefully to the talk and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first in a series of talks we have arranged for the Overseas Students Association this semester. Dr. James has very kindly agreed to speak to us today on the topic of public speaking. And judging from the large numbers of you here, it's clearly a subject of great interest and relevance. Dr. James. Hello. It's good to see so many of you here, and hopefully, what I'm going to tell you will be useful to you both here at the university and in your future employment. Many people avoid speaking publicly, by which I mean in front of, say, ten or more people, not because they lack the ability. But mainly because they lack confidence, which is really only due to lack of practice. Today, as a consequence of the influence of television, audiences expect speakers to be relatively brief and to the point, in addition to being well informed and interesting or entertaining. Probably the most important part of public speaking is what you do beforehand, by which I mean preparation. This includes practical details, such as knowing precisely what your topic is, and exactly how long you are expected to talk for. You should also plan the content thoroughly. A good strategy is to write out the content as you intend to say it, and then make brief notes, preferably on small cards, which you use to talk from. This way, you sound more natural. You incorporate pauses while you look at your notes, and you can then look at your audience while you are speaking. Never read your speech without looking at the audience. Eye contact is a very important part of communicating with an audience, so deliberately move your head and look around at your audience. Pauses are important, as most people, when they are nervous, tend to rush through their speech. Now you have some time to look at questions thirty-six to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-six to forty. Practice speaking slowly. This gives you more time to pronounce your words correctly. It's always easier for your audience to listen to someone whose speaking is clear and calmly paced, so that they can understand the ideas being explained. And the bigger the group. The more slowly you should speak. Remember to project your voice, speaking clearly to the person furthest away from you. It's a good idea to rehearse and record yourself. Pay attention to your intonation when you listen to yourself. It's even harder if you are speaking in a second language. I would imagine. But there's nothing worse than listening to a flat, monotonous voice. So try to vary your tone and rhythm. This will add meaning to your words. Lastly, pay attention to both your posture 
and your gestures. A confident person stands or sits in a small group with their head up, chin out, and shoulders back. Try to avoid scratching or fiddling with your hair or beard or pens, jewelry, and so on. These movements can distract and irritate your audience. Yet you may be unaware of them yourself. Another reason for rehearsing, preferably with feedback from a friend, or better still, on video. I hope these few tips will make your experience of speaking in public a little easier. Remember, practice makes perfect. That is the end of part four.